Welcome everyone to our presentation on Agile Teams in a Time of Disruption. Today we'll be talking about how to optimize distributed team performance given the current scenario that we have, although it could apply to any time we are disrupted. My name is Avi Schneier and I'm a principal consultant for Agile Transformations with Scrum Inc., the organization founded by Dr. Jeff Sutherland, who is the co-creator of Scrum. Distributed teams today are a little bit different than what we experienced before. Most of the time before, distributed teams were classified often as ones that had a group of workers in the office and then some remote workers. And that might have rotated based on who was on a work from home schedule. Today, we have a scenario where everyone is working from home. And so that increases the challenges provided in this time of disruption for our agile teams. And some of this is because most of the research around Agile teams and the uh, best practices that have evolved are around co-location. So how can we achieve the same level of productivity given our work from home scenario? When we take a look at different distribution styles, one example is isolated scrums. Now, the idea behind this is a scrum team operating in isolation on its own. And again, this would be probably like in office as an example. So you might have multiple scrum teams in different geographic locations that don't have a need to coordinate. The idea behind the scrum team is for it to be cross-functional, meaning that it possesses all of the skills required to do the work, everything from ideation to implementation, without needing outside help. And in that way, scrum teams can be isolated and work very well. Now, today, we have a lot of people who need to coordinate together who are not in an isolated team working in one spot. They need to hold something like a distributed daily scrum. And what we mean by this is that you have to find a way for everyone to have a touch point, even though they may be in different time zones around a single country or around multiple countries around the world. And so we have to find that overlap so that we at least have our one daily touch point. Otherwise, dysfunction can arise. Another way of looking at the distributed method or styles is to look at a distributed scrum of scrums, which is that not only do you have these distributed teams, but they need to coordinate. A scrum of scrums is a team of teams that have a need to coordinate because they put out a product or project together. And so we have to find an overlap for them or that communication breakdown can lead to issues in the future. Before you can decide how you're going to operate as a team, you really need to figure out whether or not you're a team or a work group. The difference between this was discovered decades ago, written about in literature, which is that a work group is a group of individuals operating from a single list of tasks, but not necessarily achieving anything together. A team is a set of individuals working from a common list of items. Let's call that a backlog with a specific goal that they must achieve together. So it's really not about the list, it's about the goal. People working together for a goal, that's a team. People just working from a common list, that's a work group. Back in the 1960s and 1970s, Professor Tuckman studied teams as they formed and went through their life cycle. He studied their performance versus their effectiveness, and he found that teams tend to go through a certain set of stages, forming when they get together, storming, and in this period is when all the, the human conditions come out. You know, I like to work with such and such, but I don't really like such and such. And this is where all of the personality conflicts come out and the way that we work together needs to be ironed out. If the team can do so, they enter the norming phase. And they're actually getting to work together well. And then finally, they enter the performing phase. And most of us in the Agile landscape are, are, have seen this model and are used to this diagram. What you may not have heard is that Professor Tuckman actually updated this model in the late 70s to include mourning, a fifth stage where the team actually breaks up. And that's because he was looking at teams that only persisted for a period of time which is something in Agile and in Scrum specifically that we tend to warn against. We want our teams to be persistent and stay together for a very long period of time. Additionally, today we have found that the linear idea of the Tuckman model, while great for identifying stages, may not progress as such, especially if the team stays together. 
we might want to revisit it to look something like this. Here we see the Tuckman model as a cycle. All the stages are present, forming, storming, norming, and performing. But rather than seeing them in a linear progression, we understand that anytime the team is disrupted, for example, when a new person joins or when someone leaves, it can push you back into that cycle to a place where you were previously. And of course, the team can break up at any point in the cycle, in which case mourning will occur. The idea here is that we need to understand how to get as quickly as possible from forming to norming and performing and through that storming phase, which can happen every time the team is disrupted. Moving to a completely virtual environment is the type of disruptive event that can put your teams back into a storming phase. So we have to focus on how do we get them out of here as fast as possible. Now what's interesting is, it doesn't matter whether or not we're talking about the normal conditions or our emergency and disruptive conditions. The actual way to get through this quickest is the same. Moving into a completely remote style of working for those that are not normally in that way can be challenging. Here are some of those challenges. We're used to always working together, seeing each other. There's a certain dynamic that's involved, which is now missing. Communication can break down much more easily. People have feelings of isolation and also negative emotions. Fighting negativity, whether that's boredom, loneliness, negative thought patterns that are, and emotions that are continual, depression and sadness, that can happen from working remotely and feeling so isolated from one another. Then of course, there's the change to our pattern of living. And a lot of you have probably seen blogs and posts about this on social media about what's happening to everybody because we're working in such a remote and distributed way. And of course, there's always the question of now that I'm not around everybody else, what am I supposed to do? And there's always the question of, are we actually doing stuff we've done before? Rework, are we duplicating our efforts? And from a management perspective, or even a team member's perspective, is everyone actually doing what needs to be done to drive the team forward? What we're gonna talk about is getting through things like how we help people who are used to working in the same place together, communication issues, and having misunderstandings about who is supposed to do what. The antidote to all of this is to set up a working agreement. For most of us who have been in the agile world or in working in scrum teams, we may have heard of working agreements, but many people have never actually set one up. A few years ago, I had an idea based on reading about the Lean Canvas, which is about how to create a business proposal on a single page, that you should have a way to set up a team on a single page. And so I created this canvas, which is available for everyone and will be coming to everyone at the end of this uh, seminar. In this working agreement, we handle a lot of different things, which you can see here, like team name and motto, our mission, roles and responsibilities, metrics for our team and our products, what are our strengths and skills, what are our gaps and growth opportunities, how are we gonna celebrate and improve? What values do we as a team wish to live by? And those values may represent scrum values or agile values, our company values, and things that are team values, which may not be overtly set. And then of course we have our norms and guidelines, our code of behavior that we want to institute for our team. And finally, we wrap up with our events. When are we gonna do all the things that we need to do together? You might be wondering, what is a working agreement itself? And the answer is that it comes out of the idea from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote a book called The Social Contract hundreds of years ago. The idea behind the social contract is that when it comes to a culture or any group of people, there is an unwritten code of behavior, an unwritten set of rules by which they normally behave. And in a really high functioning society, they write those rules down. For example, our constitution. Any social contract is a mutually agreed upon set of principles that describe how we work with each other as a team. It includes protocols around that and how we're gonna meet the expectations of our product owner in the case of an agile team and meet the expectations of our larger company, our stakeholders and our customers. For our purposes here, what we wanna talk about is how to help with those problems that happen from remote working. Specifically, we can focus here on Roles and responsibilities answer the question of what am I supposed to do? 
And when it comes to how we communicate together, that's going to be laid out in our norms and guidelines. The hard part about communication when it comes to working in a remote environment is that we want to feel like we're in the same room. So let's take a look at that. One of the first guidelines that you want to lay out are your communication preferences. You need to discuss as a team where you're going to store your shared digital work and physical work. That's right. Again, even when we're back in the office, this needs to be discussed. Many of us work in companies that require physical documents to still be present and stored, for example, in the medical or pharmaceutical industry. So we've got to know where all of that stuff is so it doesn't get lost and we're constantly asking each other or even other teams, hey, where's all that stuff that we were supposed to have? Now in the remote world, it's even more important for us to discuss our contact preferences. I like for everyone in the team to list their top three methods. So for example, Sally, she wants to be contacted first by whatever chat tool the team is using. Second, if she doesn't respond in an appropriate amount of time, by email. And last, by phone call, but please, not after 5 p.m. An important part of this is setting up our boundaries for communication and contact. We recommend using video as a way to connect, if at all possible. Here's why. It maintains a way deeper level of connection between human beings. And that's because Seeing each other's faces is deeply rooted within our neurology. Take a look at the young lady on the screen. How does she feel? It would be hard to tell if she was sitting in any kind of communication device with a camera off or without a camera. You'd never be able to tell what her mood was. When people are looked at, they try to appear together and present, and it helps them to focus on the task and the conversation at hand. Whereas if you have your video off, whether it's your own camera or no video allowed, we all know about the context switching that goes on in the background as messages are popping up and emails and things are distracting us. So it's helpful to get that video on and see each other. Additionally, it helps with all of these things which we've identified as problems for working remotely. It helps us feel like we're working together again. It's a better way or richer way to communicate. It fights the feeling of isolation. We can't be in the same room, but this is as good as we're going to get. And that helps to fight negativity. Human beings are social animals. We crave each other's contact and social closeness. Even if you are consider yourself to be uh, what is known in the uh, psychological spectrum as an introvert, you still need contact with other people. And it helps you not to feel so bad about the current situation. When it comes to communication efficacy, we wanna shift from documentation to conversation. It's the same as when we're together. Take a look at the graph here. As we move from ineffective to effective on the y-axis and from richness or temperature of communication from cold to hot. The best way to do it is two people at a whiteboard. And that might not be possible for us now together. But we can do two people on video conference using a digital whiteboard. That will really bring that efficacy up. And that's where we want to go, again, to fight those problems that we have from working remotely. One of the most important aspects of working in Scrum is to have a ready and transparent backlog. Now, to do this correctly, everyone needs the same access. Now, here's an important part of this. You have to choose a common tool and everyone's got to have access to it. Why a common tool? Why can't we just, why can't every team pick their own or each person pick their own? And the answer is because then we'll really have no idea about who's doing what. And that type of confusion leads to increased communication breakdown and decrease in performance. Please remember though that the items in this, these product backlog items are a placeholder for a conversation, not a substitute. The idea is that you have this item so that we can talk about it and flesh out what it really means, how we know what we have to achieve. We want to bring people together in the process that we call backlog refinement in Scrum. And that's where we take these items and really discuss them and break them down into the manageable chunks of work that we're all going to do. It lets people really engage with the work and what's required. 
and with each other. That's an important aspect of it. Most importantly, in this remote situation, we need to make sure we have our definitions of ready and definitions of done. And we don't want them to slip just because we're not there. We have to stringently hold each other accountable, not to bring items into a work period or what we call a sprint very commonly in Scrum and in Agile that are in an unready state where people don't know all the things they need to know to get it to go. We also need to make sure we have a stringent definition of done, how we're all going to know when this item is actually finished. And that's because distributed work requires more discipline than when we're all together. I can't just lean over and say, hey, Frank, what did you mean by this? How, how would that be finished? I can't just drop in my stakeholder's office and say, you know, I'm not sure exactly what you meant by this. So in order to help coordinate that, in the same level of effectiveness, we've got to get people together to do this. In that way, a product backlog helps to remedy these issues of remote work. What am I supposed to do? Well, you know, because it's in the backlog and it's tagged to you. Rework. Rework happens often because of a duplication of work and then we find more mistakes. If we have a good stringent definition of done and we've completed a, a properly run backlog refinement session, it'll avoid that. Good communication avoids disappointment in final product that eliminates rework. And lastly, is everyone actually doing what needs to be done? Well, that's also transparent if you have a good product backlog. Now, there are lots of different product backlog tools to choose from. The idea is, again, each one of them will have positives and negatives. Choose the one that works best for your team, but make sure everyone has access to the same one. A final thing I'd like you to remember is that good communication and collaboration tools can't make up for bad communication channels and lack of collaboration skills. It's only a bandage. You need to improve those improve those channels, and improve those skills. Let's talk about one way in Scrum that we do that. One of the patterns that we execute in Scrum is called swarming. The idea behind it is to get people to work together to solve a problem. It's always a good idea, but for remote teams, it's really a must. Without it, people end up in isolation. Solving a problem together pulls the team together from a human aspect as well as an intelligence aspect. One of my favorite things that I've learned in Scrum is that no one of us is as smart as all of us. Giving us a problem to solve as a team, not as just individual humans that may be making up a team, is a great way to harness the collective intelligence of the whole group. And as a bonus, it also fights loneliness and many of the other negative emotions that might come up because we feel that isolation. In the office, enabling swarming is kind of easy. Put everybody into a room together, grab a bunch of post-it notes, right? The whole landscape of Scrum and Agile is famous for that and have them start throwing stuff on the wall. But how do we do that in a distributed environment? As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, one of the original ways we saw distribution was having a bunch of people in an office and some remote workers. You can see an image of that here. Everyone's working together. This is an example, by the way, of mob programming. You can see in the whiteboard in the back, there's a large monitor and everyone's in the code there. They're working, this is a software team. But you can see in the upper left-hand corner of that monitor, the remote workers. There's a couple of them in there and they're working together too. So can we duplicate this in our fully remote world? Sure you can still have these video sharing tools, and there are many of them out there. Each one, again, has their own positives and negatives. Find one that works for you. But for us, it's not about the tool. The way we enable this, whether we're in a fully distributed setting or even a partially distributed setting, is the same as when we're in person. It's about writing our backlog items to require it. If you want people to collaborate, if you want people to swarm, then you have to write your work items so that it requires people of multiple disciplines to get together to do something. 
That's the whole key. Get them to swarm by writing items that don't have only one person that works. When one person works on an item, that's really kind of more of a task. We don't want to write tasks. Very commonly in the Scrum and Agile world, you'll hear people talk about writing stories. Well, a well-written story or backlog item is written from a perspective where it requires most of, if not all of the disciplines of the team to come together to drive it to done. You can do the same in a distributed setting. It's no different. So what about our last challenge? Work-life balance that might be disrupted, our pattern of living. Here is where we come back to our working agreement canvas. What we're really talking about when it comes to our pattern of living is this area around norms and guidelines. And it's about setting appropriate boundaries. Many of us right now, again, have been reading a lot of articles out there, stuff in social media and that's published all over about how working remotely has increased the number of hours that people are sitting in front of their computer. It's decreased the amount of spare time they have in between meetings because there's no more getting up and walking over to the next location or office. And so people are finding themselves working two or three more hours a day and feeling much more exhausted because of it. I challenge you to really be introspective about this for yourself. Find your own boundaries here and help the team set them together. Talk about what are your core working hours? How often you should take breaks? Should you have standing desks? Should you ask the company to purchase uh, different office items for your home that will enable you to physically move around a little bit and get a break from the screen time? This is really important for your physical and mental health. And I encourage you to do that. In the norms and guidelines section of our working agreement, we talk about things like respectful behavior, but it's also to talk about respecting our spaces, our personal space in our life so that we can have proper work-life balance so we can maintain our optimal productivity, but also our optimal engagement. And part of that engagement is about happiness. And a lot of that happiness is about the balance between some of us that we have to strike between, hey, I've got to get this stuff done, but my kid is here also. And now besides being parent, I'm also teacher. Take that into consideration and give some extra respect for your coworkers who have kids at home. They've got a second job that they never expected to have before. On a final note, what about scaling? Having one team do this remotely might be okay, and you might be able to get through it, but you don't have one team. You have 10, 50, 100, 1,000. Well, now it can get pretty tough, but it's not impossible. What you need are two things from our Scrum at Scale framework. We're talking here specifically about when you have a distributed Scrum of Scrums or team of teams. They need help to coordinate, and I don't mean just fancy tools. They need the company to form what we call an executive action team. The executive action team is a leadership group that's dedicated specifically to overcoming impediments that are stopping the teams from working well together and getting product out the door. That's their sole function, understanding and enabling the how of the teams. You're also going to need a second executive group an executive meta scrum. Now, whereas the executive action team should be a team functioning as a scrum team on its own, the executive meta scrum is slightly different. It's more of a forum because you're going to have a lot of different people coming. Here we have our product owners or our project managers, but we also have our stakeholders and often our leadership. The goal here is for them to get together on a uh, at least sprintly basis to align the backlog, the what that the teams are working on. And in this way, even being distributed, you're going to be okay, provided that you have separate entities that govern the what and keep the teams moving on a focused path forward from a perspective of the backlog and an executive team solely focused on the how how are our teams working together and how are they getting stuff out to our customer? 
So you need these two executive groups to enable the teams to work well together. On a final note, I would just like to say thank you for joining me. And if you have any other questions or comments, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great day.